our blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melach Haolam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Haamim Minasan Lanu Es Taraso Baruch Ata Adonai No Sein HaTorah Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. All right. So we are going to do this week's Torah portion, which is the portion of Toldos. So I first want to give a little bit of an overview, just so everyone knows or remembers the story of the Torah portion. And then there was two different ideas that I wanted to um, I wanted to discuss in the Torah portion. So just an overview. So this is like in a nutshell the whole Torah portion. So basically, it starts off, and this is what we're going to actually discuss later, how Rivka and Yitzhak, in English, it was Rebecca and Isaac, they're childless. Last week, they got married. Now they're, they're childless. And they were praying. And then God answered their prayers, and they had twin boys, Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and, and Esau. And Yaakov, by the time they were 13, they developed into the people they would be. And Yaakov was a very, very, very godly person. And Asa was a very, very evil person to such a degree that on the day they were 13, a number of things happened. Abraham died that day. It's very interesting. God shortened five years of Abraham's life so he shouldn't have the pain of seeing Asa become wicked. I think about that, you know, when I learned that part of the Torah portion, because I mean, Abraham's life, imagine what Abraham accomplishes every single day, one day in the life of Abraham. Abraham, imagine what he's accomplishing. And God said, it's worth it to chop off five years of his life. He lived to 175. His son, Isaac, Yitzhak, lived to 180. And we're told that Abraham also should have lived to 180. But his life was cut five years short, so he shouldn't have the pain of seeing Esau, his grandson, become so evil which I think really shows you how painful it is, how deeply painful it is seeing a child or a grandchild doing the wrong thing to such a degree that God said, you know, Abraham is very valuable to me, but I don't want him to go through all that pain. I'm going to take off five years of his life so he doesn't have to see that pain. So that happened. So the day Abraham passed away is not coincidentally the day that Asa becomes so evil. What does what mean evil? He murdered someone that day. What are we talking about? Big time evil. So when he was 13, he committed his first and not his last murder. And therefore, Abraham lost five years of his life to not see this. And then he comes back and he's like tired from murdering. And Yaakov, of course, Jacob, the saintly son, is cooking the lentil soup, a red lentil soup to feed his father because lentils is something we traditionally have something round. Nowadays, most of us have an egg for the same concept after someone lost someone and they come back from the burial. That's the traditional food. We give them the bagel and we give them the egg round, like the cycle of life. So Jacob was doing the same thing. He didn't make bagels, he didn't make eggs. He made lentils round, cycle of life. And Ace was like, I'm starving, give me this food. And basically they made a deal and Jacob said, you know what, you sell me the rights of the firstborn and I'll give you this bowl of lentil soup. So that was something, an incident that happened in the Torah portion. And then a famine comes to the land and Isaac wants to follow in his father's footsteps who went down to Egypt by the famine. But God said, no, 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 you are like an offering before God. You were bound up on an altar that was two weeks ago, Torah portion. You are bound up on an altar. You can't go outside Israel. You're too holy. So go to a land. So we went to Gerar, which is in Israel, but not the land of the seven nations. So it's sort of like peripheral, but still Israel. And he, like his father, says Rebecca Rifka is his sister, not his wife, because she was so beautiful and he didn't want the same problems. He followed his father's footsteps. And then they realize it's his wife and they get mad at him. But they were not as corrupt a nation as like Egypt. So they stayed there and the king 
Abimelech said, don't touch this woman. Don't touch this man. Don't start off. They're holy people. They can get us in big trouble. And even though it was a, a time of famine, Isaac becomes fabulously wealthy. So wealthy that everyone's jealous of him. And the king says, like, please get out of here. You know, you came. We were nice to you. I made sure no one molested anyone. And then you just become so rich. Like, ugh, like, like, like your, your wealth makes me look poor. Like, I don't want you around. And then Isaac leaves. And then we have this whole thing that takes up a number of verses all about wells. It was very symbolic. Of course, you could say, well, water, a desert, a famine, that's important. But it was, there was a much more deeper meaning. And basically, his father had dug wells. And the Plishtim, the people that lived in the Sarah of Garor, closed them up. And then Isaac dug a well. And the, they claimed it was theirs. He claimed it was his. And then they dug another well, which again, the neighboring people of Garor said, hey, that's ours, even though you dug it. And then he, they dug a third well, just like it's symbolizing like the three temples. The first temple, there's controversy. Like the first well they dug and there was controversy. The second well they dug, that was like the second temple. And we come to the third well and nobody fought over it because that was symbolic of the third and ultimate temple, which is called Rehovo. So if anyone has ever heard in Israel of the city Rehovo, it's named after this third well. And then he leaves that place. He went to Beersheba. And then the king comes and he says, what do you want me? You, you didn't like me. You kicked me out. What are you coming to me now for? And Elmel says, no, I, I want to make a treaty with you. I see you're so successful. So Isaac agreed. They made the treaty. And then Asav, who now hits 40, thinks, oh, even though he was abusing women his whole life, but oh, I'm going to be just like my father. My father got married at 40. I'm getting married at 40. He marries very wicked women. They were a big pain. They were idolatrous. They were idolatry to the household of Isaac and Rebecca, Yitzhak and Rivka. They were tremendous pain. And then we have the main story of the Torah portion, which we will discuss soon in greater depth, which is that Isaac feeling his end was coming, even though he actually lived for many more years, but feeling his end was coming, he says to Esau, his older son, not knowing he had sold his rights of the firstborn to Jacob many years earlier, right? He sold them when they were 13. He said, oh, I want to give you this blessing. Go prepare for me meat, and I'll give you this blessing. And Rebecca, Rivka, who was a very holy woman, heard through prophetic spirit. I mean, there was just a private conversation between Isaac and Asaph, between Yitzhak and Asaph. But Rebecca, Rivka heard with prophecy she knew this and she knew these blessings needed to go to Jacob. They needed to go to Yaakov. So she called in Yaakov, she called in Jacob and she said, you have to go and you have to take these blessings. You have to pretend you're Asap and you have to take the blessings. He's like, how can I do that? He was like the embodiment of truth. How can I go and pretend I'm Asap? That's like the antithesis of my nature. She's like, sorry, you got to self-sacrifice here. You got to go and get these blessings. And he did. And he was successful. And Asa was so mad at him, he wanted to kill him. And then again, Rebecca, with her prophetic spirit, was told that Asa wants to kill Jacob. So therefore, Rebecca said, we got to get him out of here. So she told her husband, I, this is so horrible, these horrible women, these local Canaanite women that Asa took. I don't want Jacob to marry anyone like this. He's got to go to my home place, to my very evil brother, to find a wife there, because I don't want him to get married here. In other words, I want to get him out of ace of sight, but I'm going to tell my husband I want him to get married to someone, you know, far. And, she, and Isaac said, good idea. We, we don't want to marry anyone here. We want him to marry in the family, because that's what I did. He's following his father's guidance that he had to marry in the family. Rebecca was a relative. So yeah, Jacob, of course, he's the holy one. He has to marry in the family. And he blesses him and sends him off. And then Asaph says, oh, dad doesn't like these women because they're not part of the family. No problem. I'll take another wife. And he goes to Yishmael, Ishmael, Yishmael, Abraham's first son, who by the end of his life was actually very, very, very righteous. So he went through periods of incredible wickedness and he tried to murder Isaac. At this point, he's already very righteous. And he says he'd like to marry one of Ishmael's daughters. And they began the process, but before... They actually got married. Ishmael actually passed away. And then Nachla the, married Asaph. And that is the end of the Torah portion. So that was a brief rendition for those of us that don't know anything about it. And for those of us that do, but might have forgotten because it's been a year. 
and um, just like a very brief overview. And now I'd like to focus on two concepts that we see in this Torah portion, two ideas. Before I do so, because I did sort of zip through that storyline, does anyone have any questions on it? Anyone have any questions on anything I said? Because I said a lot and I said it rather quickly. I have a question. Sure, Faye. Yeah, if you said that Abraham was, uh, would be upset and he lost five years of his life. So how come Isaac was not upset? And he wanted to bless his son. Did he know about his, you know? That is an excellent question. So the truth is that Isaac did not know the wickedness of Asaph. God, I mean, Asaph concealed it from him and God went along. So you could see, like here was very interesting dynamics and it's written very clearly in the Torah that Isaac loved Asaph and Rivka loved Jacob. <laughs> What does that mean? Rivka was a woman. So she was more, as we will say, grounded and aware of planet earth. And she saw straight through her, her son, Asav, and she knew all of his evil. She was his mother, but she knew all of his evil. And she appreciated and knew all of the righteousness of Jacob. So that's why she had a special relationship with Jacob. But Isaac did not see through Asav's evil. Asav was very careful to try to pretend he was a good person around his father. He did so because he really, really actually loved his father very much, truly, and respected him very much, truly. And he didn't want to cause his father pain by his father realizing what he was really like. So obviously, as and we will discuss this later today, it's not that Isaac thought he was the greatest, holiest person on the planet, but he didn't know of his evil. But Asa would not have had that same relationship with Abraham and Abraham would have seen his evil for exactly what it was. And you could say perhaps because Isaac was so like holy, he was literally offered as a, uh, the only time I've ever seen, I mean, he wasn't killed on the altar, but he was bound up on an altar to God. So he was like very, very pure in a way that he was very detached from this world. So he really didn't see it. On a physical plane, he was blind, which was, of course, the issue. But it's just sort of symbolic of his whole energy that he really was very detached from this world. He was very holy and very removed. So he didn't, he was so removed, he didn't get the depth of evil of Asa, but Rivka got it. And therefore, she did whatever she could to make sure that that evil wouldn't damage both in terms of twice in this week's Torah portion and twice again, God was cueing her in because both times she knew because of prophetic spirit, both to, to create the scenario that Jacob would get the blessings, Yaakov, and to get him out of here when she, again, with prophetic spirit was told that Asa was just waiting for an opportunity to kill him. Asa doesn't, I mean, I mean, Asa murdered all the time. It wasn't like a hard, big deal for him. It was more, again, he didn't want to give his father pain. So he had to figure out a way to do it. Maybe like, maybe after his father passes away or, you know, in some covert way that he could get away with it without being overtly part of the process. Um, but that's what his plans were. And that's why even when, even when Jacob leaves with his father's blessing, his father and mother are like, go, go to Haran. Like his mother, like, this is not safe for you here. His father, like, Mom says, she's right. You got to go and get a shidduch. Got to get married. Um, even there, Asa did try to kill him then because, okay, he's out of the house. <laughs> he, they won't know about it. And he sent his eldest, very evil son, Eliphaz, to kill him. Um, and Eliphaz almost did. It says because Eliphaz was raised by Isaac, so Eliphaz had some tiny flicker of humanity in him. Eliphaz was incredibly evil. Lifas was the ancestor of Amalek. He was incredibly evil. But some tiny flicker of something human in him. So he said, well, I, I feel bad actually murdering you. <laughs> you are my uncle. But, uh, you know, uh, oh, I've got to listen to my father. So Jacob said, well, listen, you could take everything I own. Because if you take everything I own, then a, a poor person is like dead. He said, good idea. Because, of course, you know, Isaac was very, very, very wealthy. And he sent Jacob with a lot to go get the shidduch. Jacob was literally stripped bare. Eliphaz literally left him naked. 
says he was walking naked and he said there was God made a dead man on the road that he took his clothing. He had literally nothing. So this was this was Asaph's intention, which again, Rebecca, Rivka was told, and that's why she sent him away. But Yitzchak, Isaac did not know. He was, he was not, in, not aware of Asaph's evil. So he didn't suffer that same pain that Abraham would have suffered. But that's a good question. Any other questions? on my overview of the Torah portion. Okay, so let's look at two, I thought there were two, I mean, obviously this is a very, very rich Torah portion as every Torah portion is. So there's so much to talk about, which believe it or not makes it a little harder to prepare the class because I'm like, what should I say? There's so much to say. Not what should I say? There's nothing to say. What should I say? There's so much to say. So I picked two ideas I want to focus on. One we're going to focus on a little briefly, and then one we're going to talk about more. So let's we're going now to the beginning of the Torah portion. Isaac married Rebecca, Yitzhak, and Rivka. Isaac, Yitzhak is 40 when they get married. Rebecca is three. How do we know their ages? What was the significance of their ages? Well, Isaac was 37 by this ultimate test of Abraham's called the binding of Isaac. You know, a lot of times, like in the pictures, you see a little boy that's totally nothing to do with true Jewish tradition. He was 37 years old. He was an adult. And of course, God didn't want him to die. He's the father of the Jewish people, and God doesn't want human sacrifice. And he comes down off the altar. When he comes down off the altar, it's very interesting. It's very clear in the verse that he, like, disappeared. Because it says Abraham returned. And the question is, well, where is Isaac? So our sages say that Isaac went into hiding for three years. And there's a, a very strong opinion in the sages that he was hiding in heaven. That he actually went up to heaven for the next three years, not as a dead person, as a living person. But because he had just gone through something so dramatic, it's the type of thing that people like talk about. And when you talk about it, that creates a negative energy. If you've ever heard of the term ayin hara, like a negative energy that could harm you. It's like when people are talking about you. They're not even talking anything bad about you. They're just like all talking about, oh my God, do you know? Did you hear what happened? Da, 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 da. So to protect him from people talking about him and therefore the negative energy that could create, for three years, he was in hiding. At the same time that Isaac was having the binding of Isaac and then going up to heaven for three years, his soulmate, Rebecca Rifko, was born. So she's a baby, she's a newborn. Obviously you can't marry a baby. How old was she? How old was she old enough so we could marry her and get her out of this enormously wicked place that she would grow up in? Three. When she was three years old, that was the age that she was ready, believe it or not, to get married. And the sages say that day she turned three was the day Eliezer came, last week's Torah portion, and took her out because it was such an evil place. She was called the rose among the thorns. Everyone there were thorns and she was that one rose. So we just want to get her out and save her from all this evil that's around. That's already been around her for three years. That was way long enough. Now, obviously, if she's old enough to get married and if you read the Torah portion, you understand her three has like nothing to do with your vision of a three-year-old or probably not a 10-year-old, not in our years, probably a 25-year-old, but people nowadays have the luxury of staying young for many, many years. But again, if we think, I go back a hundred years, for sure, 150 years, I mean, people were adults when they were 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. So she was probably comparable to that as we can see in the storyline that how did she get picked that Eliezer, servant of Abraham, knew this is the right woman. She comes, she's a shepherdess, the three-year-old. She's taking her flock to give them water, to draw water for them. And Eliezer goes over to her and he says, oh, can I have a sip of water too? I'm like so thirsty. And she looks and she's like, just you? He had 10 camels that had been racing all day. He had all his men with him. She said, I'll not only give you water, I'll draw water for all of your camels. So this girl goes and draws water and gives water to 10 camels, and we assume to the camel drivers as well. So obviously her physical maturation, obviously her intellectual abilities were nothing like we envisioned three, but biologically she was three years old at that time. And we want to get her out as soon as possible. So being that she was so young, 
when she gets married, Isaac 40, not like a really 40 year old, and she three, not kind of a 33 year old, physically, she wasn't able to have children yet. Says she couldn't have children until she was 13. Like they gave her 10 years where she couldn't have children. Now, when she's 13, she's totally physically capable of having children, no issue, but she didn't conceive. They waited a year, they waited two years, they waited three years. All of our matriarchs were barren. Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah, who had children right away. She was barren. Just God opened up her womb right away. He did a miracle really fast. All of them were barren. All of them had to go through the pain of not having children. All of them had to turn to God with a lot, a lot of prayers to bring down this blessing. So for 10 years, she doesn't have children. And now Isaac is in sort of a quandary, a dilemma. He, as we've seen, as I already said in overviewing this Torah portion, he likes to follow in the footsteps of his father. Well, what did his father do when his mother was barren after they were in Israel for 10 years? They were barren for many years. But Abraham said that doesn't count because we're not in Israel. And Israel is different. But when they were in Israel and they were married for 10 years and they had no kids, that's when he took Hagar. And, and they had you small. So Isaac knew he shouldn't do that. Again, he was God's pure, pure offering. He shouldn't take another woman. They said, and that's it. No, we just got to pray harder. We got to pray and pray and pray. So it says that Isaac and Rebecca, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. Now he's 60 and she's 23. And they're praying and they're praying and they're praying. They're both perfectly righteous people, perfectly godly people, perfectly nullified to God people, our patriarch and matriarch. And yet, and this was a point I wanted to focus on, it says that God answered whose prayer? Does anyone know? He answered uh, Isaac's prayers. He answered Isaac's prayers. Rifka, do you know why? It says because he was um, uh, born from both righteous parents and he was righteous. And Rivka was righteous, but her uh, parents were not righteous. Exactly. Very interesting point. So we have here these completely, both perfectly saintly righteous people. But as Rivka knew perfectly, Isaac's prayers are answered, not only because he's a perfectly righteous, but because he comes from perfectly righteous parents, Abraham and Sarah, and Rivka, Rebecca's prayers were not answered as fast because though she was perfectly righteous, but her lineage was not, you know, not coming from holy stock. That's very interesting because you could say, wait a minute. I think it's even more special. Here's Rebecca, born to such evil people. If you remember last week's Torah portion, her father tried to murder Eliezer, you know, her mother, her brother. I mean, evil, evil people, and she's so righteous. That's such a testimony to her righteousness, which it is. It is. It's a tremendous testimony to her righteousness. But still the sages say, even though that's true and they know it's true, Isaac had multiple merits. In other words, Rebecca's merits were maybe even greater than his, but it's just her own. Isaac had all of his merits and all of his father's merits and all of his mother's merits. So when you put all those merits together, that's a lot of merits. That far outweighed Rebecca's perhaps greater personal righteousness. It's a very interesting concept here because it teaches us the concept of the power of our ancestors to help us. This isn't just something that happened to Isaac and Rebecca thousands of years ago. This is a true fact as it says clearly in Torah, the merits of your ancestors protect you for four generations. Four generations mean your parents, any merits they had, your grandparents, your great grandparents, your great, great grandparents. So here you are, here you are. If you knew your great, great grandparents, that'd be pretty impressive. If you heard of them, that'd be pretty impressive. But imagine what that means. Your parents. Now go back a previous generation to your grandparents. Now go back for hopefully, I assume pre-communism, your great grandparents and your great, great grandparents. 
all of their merits are protecting you and bringing you blessings. It's a very powerful thought how our ancestors are still there for us. Obviously, not only if they're no longer alive physically, but even if they never met us. How many people meet their great, great grandparents? And yet they're in heaven doing whatever they can that their marriage should protect you. Goes for four generations. It says by life cycle events, three generations come. Which would mean Menucha's having uh, her daughter's wedding soon. Did you have it already? Are you having it soon? Menucha? I don't know. No, it's, it's in it's December. Soon. December okay. 9th. So yeah. by Menucha's daughter's wedding, by Esther's wedding, obviously her parents are there. Her grandparents, alive or not, are going to be by that wedding. And Esther's great-grandparents, meaning Menucha's grandparents, Esther's great-grandparents are going to come to the wedding. For three generations, they come to life cycle events. Your parents in this world or in the next, and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. But the merits are four generations. So even the great-great-grandparents, I might not show up for the wedding, but their merits are still going to protect their descendants. Now, what about if they weren't good people? <laughs> Does their bad cling to us also? So it says that if we have in the same line bad in our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, it would affect us if we're following in their ways. And then it could be like an accumulation of the negativity. But the good happens automatically, meaning you don't have to be virtuous for your ancestors' virtues to help you. And it's, it's very, I thought that was such a powerful, practical thought to know as we walk in this world, we're protected by all the angels created by all of our ancestors. Did anyone ever have that experience in life that maybe something happened to them and they're like, whoa, I did not deserve that. Like God gave, did something for me I did not deserve. Maybe it was in the merit of a righteous ancestor because I don't think it was my merit. Does anyone have an example like that in their life that they can pinpoint and share? I can say that I have that thought once in my life when uh, uh, my daughter gave birth to a boy, my grandson. Uh, because in our family, which we don't know very far, but since Holocaust, there always were females born in our family. And it was kind of like a joke of the family that Oh, no boys, girls. Yeah, only girls, no boys comes to this family. And uh, when, uh, and it's like I remember with my parents uh, joking about that. And um, so, unfortunately, both of them not alive anymore when this boy was born in our family. And I thought that's probably their. You're friend. pulling some strings. <laughs> Yes, uh, so that's one time that sort of came to me that without their strings up there, that couldn't have been happening. It would probably have been a girl. Right. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else has had that feeling, that experience of something happening and you feel like, I think that was from somebody else's merit? Holy ancestor, I might know or might not know. I, I, Rachel? I already mentioned probably multiple times about my grandfather. And um, when um, my first grandchild was born, the rabbi who was like there for the breeze, he probably referring to the fact that my children got married to Jews even if they are not that observant, but, uh, and now my grandchild is going to have a breeze. He, he said, 
you know, somebody is praying for you. Somehow you deserve that good. And I was like, yes, I'm sure it's my grandfather. That's very special. I know you have shared that and it's very, very special to have that in your heart. And here you, you knew him and you knew his righteousness yeah. and you could see how it makes sense that he said, no, 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 no. I, I need descendants that know they're Jewish. I am not fair, not fair, God. Everything I did for you, I need Jewish descendants. So he made sure Rachel should remember and her children should know. And, and now you said the merit his merits would go to my grandchildren. Yeah, that would be the fourth generation. That's good. God willing. God willing. You should see it in all of them. Yeah. God never, God never, this sort of relates to another important concept that God never, uh, his expression in their Abish to Blyfnish came Balchayv, which means God never is indebted to us. God always pays back. And sometimes, we really don't see how God pays back. Especially like if someone, you know, I mean, if someone's alive, you know, there's always opportunities. But if someone dies, then we, then in our small brains, well, the story's over, you know, close the book, we're done. God says, don't close the book. It's close that chapter. It's not the book, it's a chapter. So God always pays back. Oh, oh, I didn't pay back in your lifetime. I mean, you died sanctifying God's name. How could you possibly pay back? You're dead. God says, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm good. I'm faithful. I'm trustworthy. I always pay back. And sometimes it could be, you know, for someone that died for God or suffered for God or lived for God and didn't merit to see as we're talking here in this Torah portion, the importance of Jewish nachas, you know, pleasure and feeling the continuation of the line and the continuation of relationship with God. And you don't see it in your immediate descendants. God says, trust me. Trust me, I'll give it to you. I'm faithful. I'm rewarding you. I know what you want and I'm giving it to you. So it definitely, it definitely could happen as Rachel's feeling in her situation. Anyone else? Anyone else have something they'd like to share? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, let's hear. This is my mother. You hear you hear yes. Me? Yeah, yes. well, I, um, I'm sure you know about it, but I guess the rest of the audience doesn't know that um, I, um, I just went on a trip that was really unplanned for, and I decided on the spur of the moment that I'd like to join my granddaughter in going on this trip. And um, I've had a lot of hard times recently, very hard times. And I think that, you know, the Abish really rewarded me now with this trip well that's a very beautiful thing my mother went to her her great grandson's upsharon her great grandson's three-year-old haircutting ceremony how many people have that pleasure and that privilege and she made and they made a whole weekend of it and they had all these meals and all these parties and all these celebrations and you saw the pictures. I saw that we all the pictures. Here. As we're doing our regular life, they're just partying and enjoying and, you know, celebrating in like Florida. It's so a beautiful, uh, beautiful setting in Florida, no less. Right. It was. Yeah. yeah. That was, that was, that was God. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying it was like, a, it was Midnight to Mayim, the whole thing, you know, it just happened the last minute. My daughter, my elder daughter was encouraging me to go the whole time. And I said, I didn't make the ticket. I didn't think I was up to it. The last thing I was going to do was go on this trip. And then my granddaughter came over to pick up something the night before the trip. And I said to myself, gee, and I was going to wish her well. And I was thinking to myself, gee, I really would, would love to go along. And I shared it with her. And lo and behold, there was a seat on the plane. And going and coming and you know because they made their tickets a week and a half earlier and everything fell into place it was just just well that could and have been from her own beautiful. merits but connecting to the theme it could have been from other people's merits that were helping mm -hmm. my mother there and just making everything work out so 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 beautifully and i just want to share that mm -hmm. yeah it was Thank you. beautiful and it was so so nice of God to just make it all work out. Right. 
Absolutely. Anyone else have something they'd like to share then I'll, or I'll move on to the next idea? Yes, I would like to share. I, I think I told you this story before when my niece was getting married in Jamaica. The wedding was in Jamaica. And um, I was sure that um, it's my mom was praying for her in heaven because the dream I saw then, uh, like a few days after my ma our mom passed away, she was in the same place in Jamaica and we were driving from the airport to the hotel. And it struck me that I saw this picture before in my gym after my mom passed away. So I had very strong feeling that she was, like she arranged this marriage, she arranged this, she took in heaven and she was praying. And your, and your niece married it's Mary, a Jewish boy? Yes. And she met him in Israel. That's a big uh, blessing. Not, not, not common, not cheap, not small. Your mother might have had to send a lot of prayers in that direction to create that scenario that she met in Israel, a nice Jewish boy, and they got married and, uh, and uh, continues. That's a, that's a big, a big gift, a big merit. But yes, I remember it's very powerful. Manucha shared that. I remember my mother-in-law's house. We had the class there and we were discussing dreams. And Manucha shared that dream that she had shortly after her mother's passing, seeing her mother smiling in some foreign location, which turned out to be uh, her niece's uh, destination wedding mm -hmm. locale. <laughs> It was very powerful. Yes, I definitely remember that. It was very powerful, very powerful, and very powerful how, how, yeah, how they're there for us, how they're helping us, how they continue to be part of our lives. We, we might not be aware, but they're there. So that was one idea from the Torah portion that I thought was very powerful. Obviously, there's many other powerful ideas I'm skipping. And now I want to speak about what probably will be viewed as the central story of this Torah portion which is the idea of Jacob, under his mother's direction, taking the blessings that Isaac thought he was giving Esau. And I want, I want to explain, now there's, again, I have like 15 minutes, I could probably talk for a few hours about it. But I'll just try to touch on a few important points in this, in this concept. So here's Jacob, here's Isaac. Again, as we said, actually responding to Faga's question, I said that Isaac, was not aware of the depth of evil of Asa. And he's planning on giving him this blessing. And Rebecca is told with prophetic spirit and she knows what she was told. She's like, Jacob, you've got to go get those blessings. Um, so what were these blessings? And why did he want to give them to Asa and not Jacob, not Yaakov? So we said, as I happened to answer, answering people's question, that Isaac, that Yitzchak loved Asa. He was not aware of his evil. Asa, as I said, had a lot of honor for him and he pretended to be religious for his father's sake. He was a very, very, very intently evil person, like beyond any evil person you could imagine. That's how evil he was. He was like a villain of a villain, black, black, black. I'm saying he's 13, he's trying to murder and doing many other horrible things. But in front of his father, he truly loved his father. He truly did not want to give his father pain. He truly wanted to give his father joy. And he knew, obviously, his father would have a lot of pain if he knew what he was like and would have a lot of joy if he was following in his footsteps. So he did his best to fake it. He did his best out of, out of truly honoring his father. Truly, our sages say, Asaph truly honored his father. He truly loved his father. He was truly honoring his father. So obviously, Isaac knew he wasn't sitting and studying all day. He was a hunter. Simple person, a hunter. He's not not what Isaac would want necessarily from his son, but not a bad person, just a, a simple person. Of course, he knew Jacob was a very holy person. I mean, that was no question. He knew Jacob was following Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob was absolutely holy. And we see that he didn't think Asa was so holy because when Jacob, now Jacob was the embodiment of truth, the embodiment of honesty. When he's coming pretending to be Asa, he does a horrible job of it. To be honest, he did not do a very good job because it was totally not his character. This whole thing was total martyrdom on his part, self-sacrifice to do this. So he slips and uses God's name. He tries to pretend he's like Asa, but like Asa doesn't use God's name at all. 
it's Isaac is like, what? Asa is saying God's name. That's too weird. And he was polite. I mean, he was trying to sound rough, but he couldn't help it. He was just naturally very polite. So Isaac is like, Asa so polite. Like what's going on? So, and, and then when he smell, when he comes close and he kisses him and he smells him and he smells the scent of the garden of Eden on him, he's like, Asa smells like the garden of Eden. What's going on? This is too weird. This isn't Asa. So obviously, if Isaac was surprised that Asa was using God's name, was surprised that Asa was polite, was surprised that Asa smelled like the Garden of Eden. Remember, Isaac knew the smell. He was there for three years. Obviously, he didn't think he was such a righteous, godly person because, you know, I mean, being polite, using God's name, that's pretty normal for a godly person. So he understood Asa was not such a holy person. He didn't know how bad he was but he knew he wasn't such a holy person. So why did he want to bless him? He wanted to bless Asa. He wasn't interested in blessing, blessing Jacob in this part of the story. He wants to bless Asa, but he's aware that Asa is at the least a very simple person, ignorant, not so focused on God. What do you want to bless him for? So to understand what he wanted to bless him for, we need to understand what the blessings were about. And to understand what the blessings were about, we should start by saying what the blessings were not. These blessings were not the primary blessings of the Jewish people. Isaac would never have given those blessings to Esau. Isaac had no questions on that. Isaac knew the line of Abraham was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So the blessings of Abraham the Jewish people, the land of Israel, those were Jacob's, no question. And these blessings, as we read them in the verse, are not about the land of Israel and are not about the Jewish people. So what we would think of as the most important blessings, he wasn't planning on giving Asaph. I mean, why would he give the blessings of the Jewish people to Asaph? Asaph's not the father of the Jewish people. A hunter, a simple, coarse, ignorant hunter, he's not the father of the Jewish people. Why would I give him Israel? He's not the father of the Jewish people. So that wasn't the point of the blessings at any point. And we see, also we see very clearly the difference between how he understood Jacob and Esau is that when he wanted to bless Esau for whatever reason that we haven't said yet, he says to Esau, go hunt, prepare me food, bring it to me so I can eat it and bless you. When he wants to bless Jacob, he just blesses him. No preliminaries, no prepare for me food. So what's going on? Why did he feel he needed the meat by Asa, but obviously not by Jacob? And this is a point I wanted to bring out because a blessing for most of us, for a blessing to work, we have to be deserving of the blessing. The blessing is compared to rainwater. If rain comes down on an unplowed field, it's gonna roll right off. Nothing's gonna happen. It's not gonna get absorbed in the field. It's not gonna help your crops grow. But if you till the soil, if you plow the soil and then the rain comes down, the rain will be absorbed in the earth and then things will grow. So that's the classical metaphor, I did not make it up, for a blessing. If it's a blessing by God, or if it's a blessing by a holy, righteous person, like here, Isaac was giving this, Isaac was the leader of his generation, the holiest person, the Rebbe of his times. So if Isaac is giving a blessing, you need to be worthy of it. And Isaac knew that Asa was not a holy person. So that's why he says, go, this whole process. And it's not like Isaac was especially hungry. I don't think he normally had a very big appetite. You know, <laughs> He said, go hunt, prepare the meat, go through the whole process, which was supposed to take time, which is why Jacob managed to get in there first. Um, because he wanted him to physically work for him. So there would be this merit, the merit of honoring his father, that then the blessing would work. He could absorb the blessing. But if Asaph didn't have any merit at that point, if there was no special merit, again, not realizing how evil Asaph was, but just knowing how blessings work, Isaac knew the blessing wouldn't, wouldn't be absorbed by him anyway. It wouldn't cling, it wouldn't stick. Conversely by Jacob, when he at the end of the Torah portion blesses Jacob knowing he's blessing Jacob, he doesn't tell him to do anything because he knows Jacob is so holy, he knows a blessing's gonna stick. But this is, this is um, 
this is a very important practical point that I wanted to bring out. I'm, I'm going to continue explaining the, the, the storyline, but this I thought was very practical for us to understand because often we want blessings. We want blessings from God. Maybe we turn to the tzaddik. Maybe you write into the Bhagavad Gita Rebbe to get a blessing. Maybe you go to, to a very holy person to get a blessing. So besides needing the blessing, you need the blessing to be absorbed by you. You need to integrate and internalize that blessing. So it's very important to add in your own spirituality, of course, both to elicit the blessing. You want to do more for God to elicit that you should receive a blessing. And you also are doing more for God. So when the blessing comes down, you can internalize it. Because even if what you did was enough to elicit the blessing, but if it wasn't internalized because you didn't do enough to like absorb it, like I said, the field wasn't properly tilled and plowed, the blessing come down and you're still not going to see the results. So that's why it's very important for ourselves, like Isaac here was trying to help Asaph. So for ourselves, if we're looking for blessings in our life, we have to add in giving God more, both to bring down the blessing and the blessing that's brought down is absorbed and internalized by us. So getting back to what we're saying about here. So what were these blessings? It wasn't for Israel that Jacob got. It wasn't for the Jewish people that Jacob got. And Isaac knows that Asaph's no great holy person. That's very obvious from many details in the storyline that I pointed out, plus more that I didn't, I'm sure. So what were these great blessings that Isaac wanted to bless Asaph that Jacob literally risked, risked his life for as he knew what would happen? He was thinking either his father would find out it's him and be very upset with him, which did not happen at all. When his father realized it was him, his father got it completely. But Asaph, definitely, there were a lot of repercussions. Asaph tried to kill him over these blessings. Rebecca said, go on self-sacrifice to get these blessings. What were these blessings for? So there's various ways of understanding them. But just to explain a little bit, as we look at the storyline of blessings, it's very obvious. The blessings were for abundant physicality, wealth, and power in the most physical realm. They weren't for spirituality. There's nothing spiritual in the blessings that we see. Some can explain them as spirituality, but simply speaking, they weren't for spirituality. As we said, there's nothing to do with the Jewish people or Israel. It was for physical wealth and physical political power, physical strength. So why did Isaac want those blessings to go to Aesop? And why did Rivka say, no, Jacob, you need to get these blessings? So one way of understanding it is that Isaac totally saw Jacob's holiness completely. He understood he wasn't like not getting how holy Jacob was. He knew exactly how holy Jacob was. And he knew Asa was not holy. Again, he didn't understand his depth of evil, but he knew he wasn't holy. And in essence, because of that, like every Jewish parent, he had fears and worries and concerns for both of his children, right? Sounds like all of us. We all have fears and worries and concerns for our kids. So what were his worries? He's like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in this world. Jacob, I know he's going to survive. He's so holy. He's so pure. He sits and learns Tyra day and night. How are he, how's he going to make it in the world? How's his children going to make it in the world? They're going to be so holy. God's chosen people. How are they going to live? I mean, I want them to be holy, but how are they going to live? So he, he, was, he was a worried Jewish father. And then he looks at Asa, and he's also a worried Jewish father. And he's like, I don't know what's going to be. He's so common. Hey, he's a nice kid, but he's a hunter. He's so ignorant of Jewish law. He talks so plain and not very nicely. He's not going to have a relationship with God. My son's going to be like, you know, any, any person on the street. Nothing about him even smells of being a, a Jew or a godly person or a connected to God person. What's going to happen to my son? He's going to be like every, you know, person off the street. So he was worried for both of his sons. And then he had an idea. What was his idea, so to speak? He's like, I have a great idea. Why did God do this? Obviously, God knows what he's doing. It's to create a beautiful partnership. 
because Jacob is so holy, he can't deal with the biblical world. And Asaph, unfortunately, is not very spiritual. So let's, we're going to leave Jacob holy. Asaph will be like his protection, like the leaves and the branches around the fruit. And he's going to interface between him and the physical world. So Asaph will have a relationship to holiness. He's not going to be holy, but at least he'll be close to it because he's going to be helping holiness. And Jacob will be able to live in a pure, holy life and he won't have to deal with anything because Asa will take care of it for him. And therefore, Isaac wanted to bless Asa because here he needs the resources for two nations. He needs the strength and the political power and the wealth to support his own nation and the nation that Jacob's going to produce. And this almost in a sense sort of happened much later in history, not with Asa, of course, but that was sort of like for a certain time in our history, what was going on with the tribe of Levi, right? The tribe of Levi was one of the 12 tribes, but they were different. They weren't farmers. They weren't peasants. They weren't tailors. They weren't wood choppers. They weren't blacksmiths. They weren't carpenters. They were people that served in the temple and that were involved in holiness. But how they survived? Because the Jewish people took care of them. So you had the tribe of Levi, the Jewish people, and the world, almost sort of like Isaac's vision of Jacob and his descendants, and then Asa, and then the world. So why didn't it happen the way Isaac was thinking, if that's in a sense almost what happened later with Levi? For a very simple reason, because he didn't get how evil Asa was and how Asa would never have taken his wealth and power and used it to support Jacob and his descendants. Asa hated Jacob and his descendants. And the more power he had, the more he would have used it for his own self and his own persecution of us, as of course happened when the descendants of Asa, the Romans, ascended to power, they didn't do it. They didn't have it to help us and they didn't use it to help us. So Rebecca seeing Asa's evil understood as Isaac did not, that all this power is just gonna hurt us. It's not gonna help us at all. And the more power they have, the more they'll use it to abuse us. And that's why she said, you got to get this. We can't let this go to Asa. This is too dangerous. If this power and wealth, you need it because for sure it can't go to him. So that's on one level of understanding what the blessings were about and what Isaac was thinking and why he was giving them to Asa. And it wasn't to hurt the Jewish people, but in his head, it was to help the Jewish people. And why Rebecca saw it, no, 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 this will be very much hurting the Jewish people. Not veering away from that, but just understanding it a little more deeply. A little more deeply, there's a deeper problem with Isaac's vision of the nation of Asav receiving all the physicality to take care and protect the nation of the Jewish people. And the problem is because, I would ask for your insight, but it's a little late. So the problem is because our job is to use the physical world and gift it to God. Our belief, the Jewish belief is not that if you're very holy, you don't engage in physical in the physical world. We believe that you're very holy and you use the physical world. And as we actually see the sages in the Talmud, all of them had professions. All of them were engaged in some very physical pursuit while being the great, great sages of the Talmud. We use the world and we give it to God. So if the Jewish people are so holy, they are specifically the ones that need the blessings of wealth and power and physicality and all of its dimensions. Because the more we have, the more we can give it to God by using it for God, by using it to study Torah, by using it to do the commandments and by using it by leading a godly life. If you lead a godly life, then all of the physicality that's making up your life is part of leading a godly life. And it's giving that godliness to God. In other words, we have an ability to take the physical and make it spiritual in a way no one else in the world can. So even if we would fantasize <laughs> that Asaph is good, like maybe nowadays he is as we come close to the advent of the Mashiach, Asaph is already refined, Asaph is good, but he still can't take physical and make it spiritual. To take physical and make it spiritual, you need to be a Jew. And that's why the Jewish people need Asaph's blessing. And, it, and it's a bit of a challenge, meaning to use the physical and give it to God is not easy. Like on a very simple level, it's far easier to fast for God than to eat for God. Fast for God means you don't eat. Okay, God, you don't want me to eat today? I won't eat today. No problem. I'm fasting for God. 
Oh, you want me to eat for you? What does that mean? That means I'm supposed to eat and remember you. Not just, and, and it's kosher, and I make a blessing before and after. And I use the energy to serve you. And I'm eating not for myself, but for you. That's hard work. That's far more challenging and far more demanding work. So having physicality and being God-centered about it, making your home beautiful in a God-centered way is challenging. Buying clothing in a God-centered way is challenging. And this, this is the challenge that God wants from the Jewish people. He wants them to have lots of physicality and, and use it to serve him. And that's why for Jacob, us, to have these blessings, it can only come in disguise. It can only come Jacob dressed in Asaph's clothing because it's like he was really taking something that's not ours, but needs to be ours. Really? The Jewish people are spiritual people. The Jewish people are holy people. Get to know yourself. We're holy people. And the world, what Ace of symbolized, is physical. So the blessings of physicality, of power, of wealth, those, those belong to Ace of. Those don't belong to us. But we need to get them. Because we need to take all this physical stuff that doesn't innately belong to us. And we need to use it because we need to give it to God. So we need to have it to be able to use it to be able to give it to God. So we needed these blessings. And that's why Jacob had to get dressed in Asaph's clothing, in disguise, so to speak, pretending to be part of the world, but he's really not. It's covert, it's disguise to get these blessings. And that's also a very deep message for us to recognize about our own lives that we're all like in disguise. Because we all look pretty natural, pretty human, pr pretty earthly. And we're in disguise. We're Jews. Jews are God's people. Jews are holy. The world knows it. I had a woman scream at me today <laughs> about something. I don't know her, whatever. But, you know, whatever. she didn't know me either, I was, whatever. And I was just trying to be, I didn't want to even more like, you know, put up a bad impression. Obviously, she you knew I was Jewish. So I just sort of like politely listened for five minutes as she screamed at me. Um, so she said to me, like, you know, in her rant, oh, you know, you uh, just because you're the chosen people, is exactly what she said, just because you're the chosen people, whatever, whatever else she was saying. So I felt like it's so interesting here this woman is. I don't know who she is at all. Right when she's looking at me, she's like, she's a Jew. I know she's chosen. I don't like her very much, but just because you're the chosen people. So just because we're God's people, we really are different than the world, but we wear a disguise. And the disguise we wear is that we look very human. And we're wearing that disguise so we could be like in Asaph's clothing. So we could be in the physical world, taking stuff that maybe is not innately ours because we're holy spiritual beings, but we need to take it for God. We need to use it and as we use it, elevate it and give it to God. If I use it for a commandment, I'm giving it to God. If I use it for the sake of God, I'm giving it to God. If I use it to live a godly life, I'm giving it to God. And that's what God wants. The problem is sometimes we get fooled by the disguise. Sometimes we don't realize that we're in disguise. And we don't realize that we're above the world, though God wants us to be within the world at the same time. Sometimes we just are within the world and we forget. We forget that we're in Asaph's clothing. We forget we're in disguise. And that's, that's part of the, the challenge of our existence is not to get fooled by our own disguise. And to know that just like our forefather, Jacob, had to put on Asaph's clothing to get Asaph's blessings, to get stuff that don't innately belong to us, but we need because God wants us to use to serve him with them. But they're really Asaph's, they're really physical, but we have to take the physical and bring it up to God. So we all are following along in that road and need to balance wearing the disguise, using the physical world, gifting it to God, but remembering it's all disguise. Remembering we're really above the physical world. And that's, that's another dimension of why Jacob had to get into Asaph's clothing, why God didn't just tell Isaac, give these blessings to, to, to Jacob. I mean, God could have just removed this whole story from the books. You know, obviously God and Jake Isaac were very close 
God could have said, you're misunderstanding Asa. Or Jacob needs the physical stuff also. He needs that for the Jewish people. But he didn't do that, God. He let the story play out exactly as it played out because God needed it to play out this way. Because in a sense, this really is Asa's possessions while well, ours are the spiritual arena. And yet we need to take Asa's items. We need to take what maybe isn't naturally ours, but we need to take it and use it and serve it, serve with it and give it to God. And that's one of the many challenges of our existence is not to get swamped by the physical world, but to rather be the master of physicality, not to get under it, but actually to use it as a vehicle for God. And there's a lot more to say about that, but I was trying to move quickly. So hopefully it was a clear idea. Any questions, any thoughts on any of that? It's a really real quick question. Uh, if Asa was hunting, how was this food kosher for Isaac? That is such an interesting question. And it really shows, I, I've, I've, I've thought about that myself, that it shows that Isaac trusted Asaph, that it wasn't like hunting with a bow and arrow, but that literally he was going to catch the animal and do a proper shrita. And he trusted him that he would doubt. He does say in the verses, as Rashi explains, that he said to Asaph, you're doing this for me, so sharpen your knife very well, because, if you're, because a shaykhet's knife, someone who richly slaughters, they have to like check their knife before each animal they slaughter to make sure it's so, so, so sharp. Otherwise the animal is not considered kosher. So Isaac like warned Asaph, you have to sharpen your knife very well. Like I'm gonna be eating this meat, it has to be kosher. So on one hand we see, again, he doesn't think Asaph is such a holy person that he's telling him, remember you gotta sharpen your knife. But at the same time, he trusted him enough that he trusted he was going to do it properly for his father. And it seems that he actually would have. Um, even though it seems that I think he in the end didn't hunt it, and there's a whole story there also that he stole it just to move faster time-wise, but that he did sharpen his knife and, and properly slaughter it because he knew this was for his father and he wasn't going to feed his father something that wasn't kosher. But yeah, that is an interesting question and is discussed. Anyone else? Any other questions? So much to talk about. Oh my gosh, I could talk on and on and on about that that whole situation in the Torah. All right, let's just do a little bit on Shabbos. So last week we spoke about not using the tree, not leaning on a tree if it's shaky, not climbing a tree, not sitting on a tree stump unless it's like nine inches tall. Um, now our sages prohibited using trees because they don't want us to climb the tree on the Shabbos, but we are not prohibited to use or cause the movement like with grass or plants, it's just trees. So therefore you are allowed to cause, like you could walk on grass. Well, you're gonna walk on the grass and cause the grass to bend. It's gonna be crushed under your foot. You're allowed to do that. That's not a problem. Even if you would, you could have a picnic on Shabbos and put out a blanket and sit on it and you're gonna obviously crush the grass under you. You're allowed to do that on Shabbos. It's not a problem. It's only a tree that we have all of these very, very many restrictions, many more than I mentioned last week because they're so sort of complicated, many restrictions on. But like other plant life and grass, we don't have these restrictions on. You're allowed to walk on the grass. You can even walk barefoot. You say, if I'm walking barefoot, probably I'm going to pick up some of the, so I'm going to end up not meaning to, but I just probably cause some of the grass to get loosened, to get uprooted. You're allowed to do that also because you're not intending to uproot the grass. You just are walking. Now they say, if the grass is very tall, you shouldn't walk too quickly because quick walking on the tall grass would for sure uproot it. But if you're walking not so quickly, you're not running, you can also walk even in very tall grass. Similar in thought, our sages said, you cannot smell fruit that's growing on the tree because again, they're scared. You're gonna smell the fruit. You might end up plucking it, which is completely prohibited on the Sabbath. But you can smell a flower that's growing. That's not a problem because they don't have the same fear that you're gonna to need to pluck the flower to completely enjoy the flower, you could smell it, but to completely enjoy the fruit, you're gonna eat it. So therefore you cannot smell fruit growing, fruit on your, in your table, you can, but not growing fruit, 
but a growing plant you can smell because we're not as concerned that you're going to forget the Sabbath in the moment and pluck it. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions on any of this? All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. We should have a wonderful week and take to heart the messages, really thinking of like our ancestors. Rachel was blessed that she knows. Chav was talking about her mother and father, Manucha, her mother, but also ancestors we don't know. And like, who knows what they're doing out there for us and helping us for sure. And also some of the other concepts we spoke about, wanting more blessings in your life, adding in a way to bring down the blessing and to absorb the blessing. And us in disguise, fooled by the disguise, shouldn't be fooled by the disguise and trying to use the physical. That God should be very happy to give us bountifully from the physical world because we use it so well for him. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining. You too. Thank you. Good night. Good night.